Hey, 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 it's Rebecca, and you are listening to Resilient by Design. Today, I want to dive into the topic of hiring, and specifically, I would like to share what I think is a great process for hiring. And this episode, though it is intended for the business owner, I think it is extremely valuable to somebody who is looking to get hired by a design firm. I think that these seeing things from that business owner's perspective could help you prepare if you're a student or if you're someone looking to interview or get a job at a design firm. I think that the sort of the process I walk you through today is going to help you prepare for an interview and to actually kill it and get hired. For the business owner, this is exactly what I've learned from trial and error and most specifically from the past, I would say, 18 months in my business. I worked very closely with my operations manager starting in March 2021 when she came on to really help me get things sorted. And turns out, She has a lot of great experience in HR. So though I am not an HR specialist, I do think that my learnings this past 18 months, just the little small tweaks that I have made to my hiring process has allowed me to hire more of the right people for the right roles and feel confident during the process. So here we go, my process that I'm sharing with you on how to hire the right fit. All right. (laughs) I'm Rebecca Hay, and I've built a successful interior design business by trial and error, podcasts, online courses, and so many freaking books. Over the last decade, I've grown from an insecure student to having false starts to careers, and now I'm finally in the place where I want to be. Throughout my journey, it's been pretty obvious that I'm passionate about business and helping other entrepreneurs do the same. Each week, I'll share tangible takeaways from my own experience and the experiences of other badass women to help you build your confidence and change your business. All right, so one of the biggest questions that I get from the designer community is, how do I know when to hire? How do I know what and who to hire? And I just wanna direct you guys to a few resources before we dive in to this episode, because I have talked about this before on the podcast. So I episode number eight is, are you ready to make a hire? I think that's a great place to start if you're kind of on the fence and you're not sure whether or not you are ready. I mean, I can just tell you Cole's notes. I always say to designers, if you are asking the question, probably it's time to hire or you probably should have hired yesterday. But give episode number eight a really great listen. It's one of the early episodes, but I think it will be beneficial to you guys for sure. Um, There are a few other episodes that I have done on the podcast. So as we go through this episode today um, and you're looking for a little bit more information, I will direct you to those episodes as well. All right. So hiring, oh, this is probably one of the more challenging aspects of business ownership that I personally have encountered over the years. I can tell you that speaking from experience, hiring is hard and it's not just like hiring, but knowing who to hire and when to hire and how to hire. And so today I really want to talk about the how because it's something that I got quite a bit of clarity on in the last 18 months, thanks to Mary Lee, who really kind of helped spearhead the hiring process for me. And it really helped me to streamline the way we do it. And I feel so much more confident now when I go to offer someone a job. It used to be that, you know, first of all, I have no training in HR. So, and also I never worked in corporate. So, many of you listening have experience already having been in the corporate world. So, you understand that there's a structure and a process to hiring. I did not. And so for me, it was a very steep learning curve. <clears throat> when I started my business, it was very much, you know, I don't know, I would post something on Instagram or I don't even remember where I'd post. Like, I feel like I maybe even posted on like Kijiji or Craigslist. It was mostly like asking around and um, 
maybe I posted on Indeed or Workplace. There was like a work one, Workopolis. I don't even know what it was. And, you know, you get some applications, you interview a few people. And I found the person that I thought was maybe the best qualified. Maybe their resume looked strong or maybe they were referred by somebody that I knew and I trusted that person. Really didn't do a background check. I didn't ask. Um, <laughs> I never asked for references. If I did ask for them, I never called the references. <clears throat> I also, you know, would agonize over which person to hire. Like, agonize. And I don't know if any of you have been there, but it's this, like, feeling that you don't even know what your gut is saying, right? Because people always say, just trust your gut. Well, <laughs> What's my gut saying would be my response. Like I was confused. I didn't know. I also didn't really know what the job was that I was hiring for. I mean, I had a general sense, but it wasn't straightforward and clear. One sec, I got to take a sip of my water. So I sort of treated it as, well, let's see who the candidates are that come my way. I'm not sure if you can relate to this, but it would be kind of like, oh, well, this person's really strong in AutoCAD. Yeah, maybe that's what I need because she seems really great. Or, oh, I really, this person has worked for this other like interior design firm in Toronto who like I really respect, like she must be good. Or I would think, red flag, why is she not still at that design firm? Why did she leave? And ultimately, I would always favor the designer who really kind of knew who I was or would sort of talk me up uh, or who had like a pretty portfolio that kind of matched mine. Um, And I I tended to favor the person who was kind of the most like me, which now I realize in hindsight isn't always what you want to hire. You don't necessarily need a mini me because you want to hire for the roles that you are not as strong at. I'm not going to go through my mistakes here. That is something I share in another episode um, of of the podcast. If you go to episode number 55, I recorded the three big hiring mistakes I've learned from. So go check that episode out. So, so far I've shared episode number eight and number 55, or those are both two great podcast episodes where I talk about how you know when to hire and then the mistakes I've made. So, I'm going to just sort of fast forward ahead because knowing that you should trust your gut is not helpful. I'm sorry. I just don't think it's helpful. I really, that is not how I work. Uh, Maybe because I haven't been trained to trust my gut or my intuition throughout my entire life. So when someone asks me to do that, I'm confused. And all I can think about are like the facts on paper and pros and cons. And I remember lying awake thinking like, should I hire person A or person B? Like this person's strong in this area, but that person's really strong in that area. Maybe that's what I need. I don't know. What do I even need? Which reality check, Rebecca, I should have known exactly what I was looking for, what I needed and found the person for that. I tended to be so wishy-washy, just hoping to find someone who I felt like could be like a great fit for the company, but I really wasn't paying attention to the role specific that I needed. I hired somebody once who had tons of experience working for a really big, big interior design firm here in the city. And I thought, oh my gosh, well, she's worked for that firm. She must be amazing. Well, guess what? That person had zero experience doing the boots on the ground implementation, which ultimately I learned was the area I needed the most help with. And so that it didn't set that person up for success. I was frustrated. It did not work out. Okay. So if you are listening to this right now and you are looking to get hired for a position at a company, please, please, please make sure you read the job description. So let's start with that. The very first step to the hiring process is once you know you need the help, you need to write down in a Google Doc or on a piece of paper what responsibilities are required by this person. So what are the areas that you need help with? We did this last year with Vera because we realized, you know, Vera was kind of doing it all. She was this one woman, superwoman show, and she was doing social media. <clears throat> Excuse me. She was doing, I'm still recovering from this cold. It's so frustrating. She was doing social media. She was doing all of our coaching, working on the website, um, you name it, like behind the scenes, she was doing it, <clears throat> not design, but the other stuff. 
And so we knew we needed to get her some help. And so it started with Vera and I sitting down and saying, okay, let's let's document everything that you do because you wear so many hats. And that's the thing. When you're starting out in a business and you start to hire, the person you hire or the people you hire will likely need to wear a lot of hats. But as your company grows and as you begin to scale, you will start to notice that that's not as beneficial as it once was. It's not about um, putting out fires left, right, and center. It's about staying in a lane, being really good in one area, and then finding someone else to focus on the other area. <clears throat> so we really dove down into, you know, what was it that Vera liked to do? What was feeling like it was falling off because it wasn't a priority? And and really, what I had her do was write down all the things she does but in respect to podcast courses, website, social media, client onboarding, like all the things that she was touching and working on so that we could start to group them together and say, okay, here are the things that make sense for you to continue doing. But if we could bring on some help, what would that look like? And so <clears throat> we initially thought we hired someone actually, this is freelance, but we hired co- on contract. Uh, we hired an independent contractor in the spring to, um, when was it? Oh, the spring of this year, not last year. Oh, gosh, wow. Two years of lots of hires um, <clears throat> to help with what we thought we needed help with, which was the sort of the social media creative and the metrics. But it turned out that the person we brought on really didn't have the creative ability. We thought we didn't need it that much and that the metrics and the other stuff would be more important. But we started to see in action that this person Really, though they were skilled and qualified in a certain area, that wasn't really where we needed the help. And so we let that person go. And then we had to get back to the drawing board and decide on, okay, where do we really think we need the help? And so it came it came to pass. <laughs> I feel like I'm reading like these Christmas books right now with my kids. And okay, anyways, I've got these weird like old English language in my head. And so it came to pass that King Herod, okay, <laughs> anyways, woo, Rebecca, where'd I go with that? <clears throat> Back on track. The, um, what she really wanted to have the support on was the social media, the creation. And we realized that that was the area that was really holding us back because it was so important, but it wasn't important enough because we wanted to be obviously delivering and there for our students and there for our clients. And so we formulated sort of a plan. Let's bring on an intern. Uh, and so we created a description of what we thought the role would entail. And then throughout the course of the summer with the intern, when the intern was done, we we talked to the intern. We said, okay, did this really describe your role? Where did you see that you were brought in to help additionally? And we really tried to flush out that role so that we could bring somebody in, somebody experienced um, on a, in a freelance position in the fall. And that is who we have now hired. But having it very detailed to know exactly what you're looking for is the first step. The same goes for when you're hiring a junior designer, when you're hiring an administrator. Sit down and write out all the tasks that you're going to need for that person so that you can fully understand the skill set. Is it a creative person? But is or is it somebody who is more administrative and organizationally on fire, like really good? Because I can tell you in the past, I've had kind of general descriptions that I would copy from another designer. I'd see they posted something. I'm like, oh, that sounds good. That sounds like that's what I need. If they need it, I probably need it. Has anyone here done that? And of course, it just never really worked out. And so people would come to us and we'd do interviews and I'd say, oh, you know what? I hadn't even thought about that skill set, but that person's really good at 3D renderings. Like, I know we don't really do 3D, but oh, maybe I should be doing that. Maybe that is the person I want. And I would get all in my freaking head. Okay. <clears throat> so the first step to the hiring process is writing out that job description or the role and the responsibilities so that you know what you need for your business. It's really, really important. Then you have to determine how much you're prepared to pay. And I'm saying this, it might seem like a no-brainer to some of you, but for a while, for a long time, really, I was like, well, I don't know. 
like, I don't know how much it's going to cost me. Like, is this a $15 an hour? Is this a $30 an hour? Maybe it's more. I don't know what this costs. I don't know what, what somebody, what an administrator would charge. I don't know what a freelance social media person would charge. And so I wouldn't post the, the number amount <clears throat> or I do a ridiculous range. And I was sort of hoping that I would get a better sense once the people came to me. And I would sort of say to, <laughs> I would say to Mary Lee at the beginning, I'm like, well, it just kind of depends. Let's see who comes. Like, if they're really experienced, then we'll pay them more. If they're less, and she's like, no, you need to know, are you looking for someone experienced or are you looking for someone junior? And it's no different than when you're doing marketing for your business. You need to know your ideal client. You know, are you doing DIY projects for your clients? Are you picking paint colors? Are you doing full service design? Because how you put yourself out there is going to attract that person. The same goes for hiring. You need to determine. And if you don't know what it costs, well, first of all, you should already be in the designer meetup Facebook group. Hello. Or if you're in designer's room or any kind of designer community, ask there. People will share with you. What's the going rate for an office admin? What's the going rate for a junior designer? Crowdsource that information. Use the Google. Look on the internet. Find that information out. <clears throat> And then make sure you post what the pay is for the position. You need to weed out the people who are underqualified or expecting a ridiculous amount of money that you can't afford to pay. Ultimately, you have to pay attention to the size of business you are, unless you have some kind of capital funding and you're just in it to win it and you're going big and you want to hire all the $100,000 professionals, go for it. But I recommend you determine first what the role in the description is and the responsibilities, and then put down how much you're willing to pay. So then once you've done that, you need to post it. <clears throat> Where you posted it is up to you. I can tell you that we've had the most um, pleasant experience in recent time using Indeed.com. This is not an ad. Um, I, what I like about it is it helps you to organize <clears throat> all of your applications and review them and keeps it out of your email inbox because side, sidebar, sidebar. For a long time, I would post uh, positions everywhere and then, <clears throat> and then, uh, I'd get emails. And I was like, oh, God, I don't have the time right now because I was the one doing the hiring. I don't have the time to go through this. OK, I'll like I would read it and maybe I'd forget to mark it unread or I'd forget to put it in a folder because let's be honest, life is busy. I was busy tending to my clients, doing the design, chasing um, my team around, like doing all the things, my family, like all the things I needed to do. Sometimes applications would slip through the cracks or sometimes I would just forget and not hire at all. Has that happened to you? I I did this. Oh my God, when did I do this? Oh, like two years ago, I decided I wanted to hire a video editor because I really wanted to do the YouTube channel thing again. I love doing videos, but I knew that it was really a big job and that we couldn't do it in-house anymore because we had too many other things demanding our time. And so I thought, okay, let's see if I can get a video editor. And I used Indeed and I posted what I thought I was looking for got all these applications and then we got super busy. I never even, I may have looked at a few applications and then that was where the interview process stopped. I like looked back down Indeed the other day and I like still have these, oh my God, this is like not open. Like I closed the job post and I never responded to anyone. I never organized any interviews and I definitely never hired for that role because life just got too busy. I wasn't committed or prepared. And I think, to be honest, if I'm being completely open, <clears throat> I wasn't convinced that was my next hire. It was just me having a knee jerk reaction to wanting to grow my YouTube channel. <laughs> oh, well, we live and learn. So <clears throat> make sure the description is there. Make sure the dollars are there. And then post it. I recommend one place. I find it can get confusing <coughs> if you're posting everywhere. If you use Indeed on your Instagram, say, go to, go to this link to get the, to go to Indeed. <coughs> Some people want to go straight to their email. If you 
<clears throat> are a solo and it's just you, I recommend you create a secondary email in your domain that's either info at or admin at or hiring at or whatever you want to call it. And that's the email that you use so that A, you don't get inundated with emails in your inbox, though you can turn off that feature for Indeed. But B, you can also like keep things organized. And that way, if anybody emails you organically, <clears throat> you can track it and it all goes there. Otherwise, it gets lost in the inbox. And if you do use Indeed, I really, I really recommend you use their built in feature and just keep everything there, like go through, review things. You have to be cutthroat a little bit because sometimes when you use platforms like Indeed, you're going to get people from other parts of the world looking to relocate. And if that's not what you're looking for, it can get tiring. You need to be decisive and quick. For the longest time, I'm like, I want to give everyone a fair shake. I'm going to read through this resume. Let me think. Maybe they could do the job. And then I realized I can't do that. There was hundreds of applications sometimes. And so you just kind of got to go through and know what you need. Do you need 3D rendering, for example? Well, someone who doesn't have it, they're out. Do you need someone who has experience in your city, in the design industry, because you need someone more senior? Well, go through. If they're not in your city, they're out. You have to be cutthroat. And the reason I say that is you need to know what you're hiring for. If I need someone who can just pick right up and knows where to go to Kravit to pick fabrics, knows <clears throat> already has built-in relationships with suppliers. Like if I'm looking for a senior, I'm not probably going to hire somebody who currently lives in Australia. I just, I'm not because I need someone who can just hit the ground running. Now, yes, are there always going to be those diamonds in the rough? For sure. But I do recommend that you get super clear on what it is you're looking for so that when you're going through resumes, you can have your criteria. And if they don't check off all the boxes, move on to the next resume. Okay, <clears throat> so review, review, review. I recommend that you pay to promote your, um, I think nowadays we live in a world where it's pay to play and people may not be seeing your post, your job posting if you don't pay. <clears throat> minimum, I pay like the littlest amount of money, but just something to get it in front of more eyeballs. Then I recommend you close it. <clears throat> I recommend you post the job and one week later you close it because otherwise it's going to get overwhelming. You're going to get busy doing other things and you're going to forget. Remember, if you're posting a job description and you want to hire, it means you need somebody to join your team within the next month or so. Don't hire three to four months out People aren't planning that far ahead unless it's like your friend's brother who like is living in Vancouver and is moving back in January. Like that's OK, fine. Maybe then. Um, <clears throat> so have it up for a week and then close it. And as you go and then go through the resumes, because after someone has applied to your job, you don't want too much time to pass before you reach out to them. And then go through the resumes and I would group them into if you're going to contact them for a call. The, the next step, once you have posted the job, it, so you've created a description, you determine the salary or, or dollar per hour, the hourly, you've posted the job, you've now closed the job after a week. The next thing I would do is shortlist the people you are going to contact for a phone call or a Zoom call. It is up to you. I like to do a Zoom call because I think seeing someone's face is extremely helpful. <clears throat> so because we can, you can read body language, you can see their level of professionalism, you can see how they would be with a client. And I always do a Zoom call first. This is something I learned from Mary Lee, super duper helpful. <clears throat> and I shortlist them. And I probably, I would say the most number of Zoom calls I've done would be five. Do more than you think because people... I've had experiences. So last year, we narrowed it down. We didn't get a lot of great candidates. We were looking for an admin at the time. And I think we narrowed it down to two. We'd had our administrator had left. We had someone temporarily helping for the summer. And then we were hiring in the fall. And we narrowed it down to like two people. We did the Zooms. We had them both in person interviews. We offered the job to the one person. It didn't work out. We only had one person to fall back on. And then that person had another job. So we were like, oh my God, back to the drawing board. We have to post all over again. So I recommend, because you just never know, someone might get another job or 
that you might offer it to them and then they change their mind. Like anything can happen. So I would say four to five Zoom interviews. It's extremely time consuming. I'm just going to give you a little disclaimer. There was a period of time a few weeks ago when we were looking to hire the social media and marketing manager, which is why this is so fresh in my mind. And Vera was quite sick. And so I took over all of the Zoom and all the interviews. And Mara Lee was off sailing and doing her thing because she's not with us full time. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to do this. It literally felt like it took two weeks away from me and my business. I'm not even exaggerating. It was so (laughs) much time, which is why I kind of never really fully gave it my all before. But it's so freaking worth it. I was so proud of myself for doing it and doing it the way Marilee taught me. So here's the next step. Contact the people you're interested in for a Zoom interview. So we'd like to I would like to invite you uh, to have a, you know, a preliminary first interview via Zoom with myself. And if there's someone else you want in it, you let them know and then schedule it. I recommend scheduling it all through the Indeed platform. It keeps everything streamlined so that you just go there for that one thing. You're not having to mix work inbox with hiring Um, and schedule the Zoom interviews. Ideally, if you can, do it over a tight period of time. Don't be like, oh, in the next two weeks, I'm doing Zooms. No. In two days time, I'm doing two days full of Zoom interviews, for example. And keep in mind that not everyone is going to be available. Some people might have current jobs that they can't leave for a Zoom interview. So there needs to be some flexibility. But I think I did it over three days. I did all the Zoom interviews. Uh, You know, I tried to do them back to back if I could just because I like to batch like tasks. And also I can really see apples to apples that way. And then during the Zoom interview, you need to have prepared with you the questions you are going to ask. And this was a big takeaway that I learned last year from Mary Lee. You need to ask every candidate the same questions. <sighs> this like literally blew my mind. Uh, <laughs> this blew my mind when she told me this. I was like, really? I've never done that. In fact, I never had questions prepared. I also never did a Zoom interview. I was like, come into the office on Friday at 10. And I would like chit chat and like ask them questions on the fly. Yeah, no, no, no wonder I was terrible at hiring before. So have your questions at the ready. I recommend putting them into a Google Doc for last year, Mary Lee and I had them like handwritten. We'd had like we'd sit down the two of us before the interview. Okay, what are the questions we want to ask? And we'd write them down. But then like the next time we're like, where did that piece of paper go? So put them into like a cloud document, like a Google Doc, so that you have the questions there and then write the answers because you're not going to remember. So I would keep another tab open where I would type up the answers. You could handwrite the answers as well. I've done that before. And keep them so that when you're going back and you're trying to decide between candidates, because sometimes you think it's so obvious and you look back, you're like, oh, yeah, that's the person who worked there. Or, oh, yeah, that's the person who did that thing that I thought was really cool. Or that's the person who showed up early. Write those things down. So Zoom call before your Zoom, set up a piece of paper or a Google Doc with your five questions that you want to ask. And In order to guide you on the questions, here are a couple questions or a few things that I recommend you ask. So if you are driving, you may want to re-listen to this episode and grab a pen and paper uh, because I think this is really beneficial to, to have. One thing you want to ask them is how, I'm trying to think of the wording of the question. Essentially, you want to ask them what they know about your company. So what attracted you to this role? But also tell me what you know about our business. Tell me about is a really great leading question that opens up the floor for the person to give you their feedback. This is always one of the first questions I ask. I think it's very telling who's done their research, who knows anything about what we do. When we were hiring for social media manager, um, and I asked this question, I had a couple people who were like, oh, like you do like really beautiful interior design spaces. I'm like, thank you. Yeah. But actually, 
this role is is more for marketing the coaching side of our business. And if they had done any research, they would have known that because not only was it in the role description, um, if they did a little bit of digging, they would see that we have two Instagram accounts. I have two websites. And so it was very telling. Um, <clears throat> so find, so ask that. So ask them to tell them about, to tell you about what they know about your business. And of course you want to ask things like, what about this role stood out to you? What about this job description um, makes you think you're the right fit? And let them do the talking and you take all the notes. Then you also want to ask if what, I think it's important to ask it in the Zoom call, what their expectation is as far as compensation. Because oftentimes we do, a, um, let's say, a range. We might say, okay, compensation, and you put it on Indeed, is eight between 18 and, I don't know, $30. It's really telling. Someone might say, well, 30 you know, the top end is, is really a, even a little bit lower than I'm used to getting. Or, no, I'm happy with somewhere in the middle. People will be pretty honest with you, shockingly. Uh, it's wonderful to ask them so that you know before you've met them in person, you go to the next step. You want to make sure they've even seen what the compensation is. Have they read the job posting? So make sure you ask that question as well. Um, <clears throat> other questions might be about, now it depends on the role, but might you might want to ask them about um, flexible working. Uh, what's it called? Um, like, Working from home versus coming to the studio. Those are really important conversations that I think need to be had in the Zoom call. If it's a remote position, you need to mention that. Say, how are, are you comfortable with coming into the office if it's not a remote position? For me, that was a question. I said, it's really important um, that we're just wanting candidates to know that this is not a remote position. This is a hybrid position where there will be a requirement every week to come into our studio. The reason for that is the collaboration aspect of what we do is really important. And so you need to know. We... <laughs> We interviewed someone last year for an office admin role. I was super clear in the Zoom interview that it was an in-office position, no flexibility. I needed a face so when people and suppliers come to our office, there's someone at the front desk answering the telephone. And she came, made it to a second interview, came in person, and still, and then we offered her the job. And then she wrote back asking about the flexibility of, of uh, working from home. And I was like flabbergasted, like, are you freaking kidding me? We've spoken about this. Like, what a fucking waste of my time. She she then turned down the job offer saying that she really wanted to. She thought her existing position was a better lifestyle fit because she could work from home. And I thought, then why the hell go through this process of all these fucking interviews if you don't want to come and work here? We were so clear from the beginning blowing my mind. So that could happen to you. <laughs> and we were like, cool, back to the drawing board. Um, so <clears throat> in the end, it was probably all for the best. I think things happen for a reason and you always end up ahead. But it was definitely a learning lesson. So make sure you have that conversation if it is something that is important to you that they're in the office or that it is remote. You want to make sure you're setting that expectation over the Zoom call. Okay, so once you've had the Zoom call, at the end, I always like to say, you know, thank you very much. I never offer anything confirmed in the Zoom call. I say, thank you very much. We're going to, we've got a few more interviews, uh, a few more Zoom interviews we're going to conduct. And then um, we are we will let you know if, we're, if we will be inviting you back for an in-person interview. The in-person interviews will likely be next week, Monday and Tuesday. Does that work? Okay, great. Thank you very much. We will be in touch. I like to say don't commit because you just never know what might happen, who else you might interview, and you might think you're bringing them in for a Zoom, and then the next two candidates are so much stronger that you feel bad. Well, I already invited them for a Zoom, for a, sorry, for an in-person interview, blah, blah, blah. So then once you've conducted all of your Zoom interviews, and I think it's also, I'm just going to add that I think it's important and it's okay to let them know you're interviewing multiple candidates. I always was like, sh would shy away from saying that because I didn't want, I don't know, I didn't want them to feel bad. Like, what the hell, Rebecca? Jeepers, your people pleasing is next level. 
Um, so let them know. It's fine. It's normal. And for those of you who come from corporate, you're probably laughing at me right now. Like, obviously, Rebecca, duh. Um, <laughs> anyways, this is just what I've learned, okay? This is my path. Um, then, okay, so you've had your Zoom interviews, and now you look at all the candidates, and you determine who is strong enough to come back for an in-person interview. It is okay for someone not to go from the Zoom to the person in-person interview. That is okay. Then you want to reach out to the people. <clears throat> Let's say you now want three people to come back for an in-person interview. I always say, and this is what Marilee taught me, you want to have a minimum of two people for an in-person interview. You need, even if one person you're like, yep, I'm hiring that person. You need to bring in that second person or ideally a third so that you have that comparable. Also, how people show up in person can be very different, shockingly, than Zoom. And vice versa. Someone who you think's amazing on Zoom may not be as amazing in person. Or someone who didn't really resonate on Zoom in person is a dynamo. So you want to keep that in mind. So then you offer and you schedule the time for the people to come in for in-person interviews. I highly recommend, if at all possible, these interviews can be on the same day. <clears throat> or over two days. But ideally, they are back to back to back. Because you want to be in it fresh. Make your decision and move on. So if you can get them to come in back to back, make sure you just have a chair set up outside your office so that you, if somebody comes early and you're in another interview, they have a place that they can sit and wait and not overhear the conversation. At our studio, <clears throat> we give ourselves a 15 minute buffer. Oh yeah, that's something I didn't say before. I schedule a Zoom interview to be 30 to 45 minutes. I know that sounds long, but it gives them an opportunity to ask questions. And that's something else I forgot to say. I always at the end tell them, this is your opportunity to ask me any questions. And actually at the beginning of the Zoom call, I say, we're going to keep this interview to about 30 minutes to allow you at the end to ask us any questions. We'll give you the last 15 minutes at the end of the interview to ask us questions. So you've told them that at the beginning so that they know that there will be an opportunity so they don't feel like they need to interrupt you. If you're asking questions, they know that there's time at the end to ask. <clears throat> So in-person interviews are scheduled an hour block. Same thing. We try to keep it to half an hour with 15 minutes of questions, knowing that oftentimes things will roll over a little bit. But that way you can schedule people um, on the hour or half or however you want to do it. <clears throat> so that 15 minute buffer is for someone to leave and for the next person to come. This might sound like crazy. Like, why are you bringing people back to back to back? Because otherwise, if you give yourself like, oh, I'm going to give myself a half an hour or an hour buffer. What the frick else are you going to do with that time? Let's be honest. What are you going to, you're probably just going to wander around, have a coffee. That's fine. But if you only have so many hours in your working day and you actually want to get real work done in the latter half of the day or earlier, then just get the interviews back to back. Okay. <clears throat> That's my efficiency tip for you. So we schedule them for an hour. <laughs> I hope this isn't too much information. I feel like I'm like going in deep. Okay. So before you start your interview day, make sure you have your questions printed and each person's resume printed and your notes from the Zoom call in front of you. And this is important because I don't, I don't like looking at a screen when you're in an interview. I much prefer paper. You could use an iPad with one of those stylists to take notes. I've done that before. I still find that writing the notes on paper is way more beneficial and uh, it just goes faster <clears throat> And <clears throat> versus typing as someone's talking. It just feels rude. I don't know. It's just me. I also am faster at writing things by hand than I am typing. Um, <clears throat> so you want to have that ready to go. And the interview questions need to be a little bit more in depth than what you had in the Zoom. That said, I have asked the same question because what I've done recently is after the Zoom interview, I've asked them to prepare something for the in-person interview, kind of like a little bit of homework. And for example, for so the social media role, I said, you know, I would love for you to do a little bit of a deep dive into our brand and come prepared at the interview with some feedback on what you see that we're doing well and where you see opportunities for improvement. Essentially, this, this gave me two 
results. One, I could see their their level of understanding of social media, right? Because they would talk about aspects that <clears throat> either things that to me were a bit Mickey Mouse or things that were more um, high level, but also it gives them an opportunity to actually deep dive on our brand. It forces them to look at it to make sure that this is the right fit. So I would ask then in person for that feedback, which is essentially asking them to tell us more about you know, what they know about our business, because it's really important that this person understands your company and the role. So if this was a job for an interior designer, you would want them to understand your design aesthetic. What types of projects? What about the designs um, projects that you've done stood out to them? Like what, like you want to get in and find out a little bit more because just hiring someone based on their credentials on paper typically doesn't work out for me. You need to see their level of understanding. So have a set of questions prepared. And again, I'm going to say it again. You need to ask every candidate the same question, and it needs to be worded the same way. Write it out on paper. Tell me about, tell me about a time when a client was unhappy. What did you do? Um, describe to me, yada, yada, yada. Tell me about tell me about is such a good one. Um, have you ever had a situation where? Tell me about how you resolved it. Have those questions on paper and make sure you're covering the areas that matter to you. So you need to think about, okay, what do I really need to know? I need to know about personality. I need to know about problem solving, let's say. I need to know about design aesthetic, perhaps. I need to know about work ethic. What are the things that matter to you? And then frame questions around those areas and make sure you're asking the same questions. It doesn't mean you're not going to have a different conversation with each candidate. Someone might say something and you might bring up an idea and you might say, oh yeah, well, like that's actually, that we use Asana and that's great to hear that you've used Asana before because that's how we track our projects. Um, But make sure you ask the same questions and you give them an opportunity to ask questions of you at the end. At the end of the interview, you usually have a pretty good sense. But unless you're like (coughs) rock solid, I don't offer the position then and there. I say, thank you so much. You're a really strong candidate. We have a few more people to interview this week. And we are hoping to make our decision by the end of day Friday. Or we're hoping to make our decision by next Tuesday. Let them know a timeline so that they can expect to hear from you. And they're not just every day waiting to see. Um, Then after you've conducted the interviews and you make your decision, you need to contact everyone who you interview to tell them that you have moved in another direction or that you have the position has been filled and that you appreciate their time and wish them the best so that you close that loop. You can't just not respond. And I've done that. <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah, shoot. And that's why I like using Indeed, because then I know exactly who the people are that I need to respond to and say, thank you. Um, you know, we're not moving forward. But what I can tell you from past experience, do not tell the people that are the no's until you get a yes from the person that you want. Do not say no to the people that you don't decide to hire until the person you want is ready to go. Make the offer first to the person that you want. We always send an a letter in an email. This is your offer letter, you know, and then we ask for references. And this is the part I never used to do. Um, Once we receive your, we offer the job first, then we ask for the references. We just want to contact a couple of references. If you could supply them or if they were already supplied, we'll say we're going to contact the references. Then we contact the references and send them the um, offer letter to sign. Once it is signed and we know we are good and that person's scheduled to start, that is when we will email the other candidates and tell them that they did not get the position. Um, I think that's really key because sometimes I've learned someone's like, yeah, that would be great. And then you offer the job, you said no to the others, and then something happens. That person moves to another city 
or they took another job, or they've changed their mind. And now you've told everyone else no, and yet you had some really strong candidates. You want to go back to them and say, sorry, it didn't work out with the other person. Can we hire you now? That's not a great place to be. Ho. Oh. This is like a lot more information. I didn't realize I had so much to say when it came to the hiring process. I think also, I mean, I have so many notes that I wanted to give to students or or designers who are looking to work at a design firm. But I think that hopefully this episode has showed you what we're looking for as a hiring manager, as a business owner, things like do the research If you were looking to apply for a job at a design firm, do the freaking research. Know their style and their design aesthetic. Look at how they show up on Instagram. What platforms are they on? What type of projects do they work in? What is the founder's name? Who is it like so that when you send your resume with a cover letter, always send a cover letter or an email address it to that individual. Don't say, dear hiring manager. That just shows me you haven't. You don't really care where you work. You just want a job research the founder because the chances are that is the person who will be entering interviewing you until you get to a size of company that has a, lots of employees you are going to be interviewing directly with the principal designer the owner the founder and always send a personal email or cover letter make it tailored to them nobody wants that generic letter Um, and I would include in that letter, what specifically about their company or the position spoke to you that shows me you are interested in what we are doing. And the last tip I have for anyone looking to apply for a design job, maybe as a designer or just really apply at a company follow up. Most firms are so disorganized and busy, like I shared my story uh, and sometimes they they don't like you slip through their cracks and it's not intentional. Follow up, stay top of mind. If they don't hire you this round, keep in front of them for the next time. I can tell you that some of the best hires I've made have been the people who show the most interest in what we're doing. Because that's what I want. I want a team that is in it to win it and that we are all going after the same goal. I'm not looking for someone who's just looking for a paycheck. Okay, I think I'm going to stop there because that is loads. I feel as though onboarding those employees, a whole other episode if you're interested in it. Um, But I use this process, whether it's a salaried employee or an independent contractor. Uh, The only difference would be that the... um, the actual onboarding of that person, will the contract will be different. I provide the contract when it's a salaried employee uh, for them to sign. But when it's an independent contractor, the independent contractor should be supplying the contract for you to sign. And make sure you look through it and say, hey, this doesn't make sense. Can we add this in? That is okay. Okay. There you have it. I hope you guys enjoyed that episode. Let me know. Have you had similar experiences? I would love to know from you. Uh, Join us inside Designer Meetups on Facebook to share what you thought of this episode. How is hiring going for you? Um, Have you had any, you know, kerfuffles or (laughs) what do they call them? (laughs) Roadblocks in hiring? Um, The more we share with each other, the better we will get at this because I can tell you that since I've started following this process, and you guys know I'm all about process, uh, power of process is called power of process for a reason. Uh, It has given me so much more confidence in the hiring process, not only with feeling confident when I'm with the candidates, but also makes me feel confident that I am finding the right person because I'm following all the necessary steps. Um. All right. There you have it, everyone. I hope you enjoyed this episode. We'll see you soon.